Uh, today's speaker is Professor Tonia Bonasisi, who's recently back at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he's a professor. Uh, he spent the last few years uh, starting up a very large uh, accelerated materials design and for manufacturing program in Singapore. Uh, now he's back in the US and starting up with lots of new efforts uh, to, uh, in materials design, artificial intelligence, all these things uh, here. Uh, so today uh, we're gonna hear about inverse design. Why aren't we there yet? Uh, I think this will be a broad ranging talk about lots of different ML topics. So we're excited to welcome him today and I uh, will transfer the floor over to you, Tonio. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for the introduction and thanks everybody for joining today. Hopefully it's a fun conversation about inverse design. Looking forward to your Q&A in the chat box and also in the Q&A session at the end of today's talk. So I'll go ahead and hit press enter mode. Um, we'll dive in. So uh, what I want to do is, is uh, make a little bit more um, specific the question that we're asking at the beginning, which is general inverse design of crystal materials. So crystal materials, pretty straightforward. General inverse design, that means any period, any element on the periodic table and any structure, any crystal structure, say any of the 230 space groups in 3D, um, can we access those in our inverse design approach? And from there, you can broaden it further. You could go 2D, amorphous, polymer, or hybrid, and so on. But really just focused here on crystal materials because they have a number of very interesting properties, both technologically, but also scientifically. I do want to acknowledge several people, um, many of whom uh, couldn't be here in, in this photo. This is just a small subset of the group. Um, many more. It's a bit meta, Zoom within Zoom. Um, and the goal of this overarching effort is the following. You give me a set of properties, and I give you a material, right? So a material that satisfies you, you the user, your uh, required or requested properties. And that's the essence of inverse design. It's solving the inverse problem where we go from properties to the material, to the, as Alex Zunger originally posed it, uh, chemistry, stoichiometry, and structure of the material. And um, borrowing a paper from a recent Nature Review Chemistry uh, article, uh, this shows the, the pictorial framework for the direct design, which is the way we're usually doing, um, at least in, in first principle simulations, we have a SIF file for a given compound that contains the atomic positions, the stoichiometry implicitly, and the chemistry, what elements are there. And then one's computing or calculating the functionality. And uh, there's there have been a few great talks recently. I encourage you to go back and look at the list. Uh, Taylor Sparks, Aaron Walsh, a few others come to mind uh, in this general space. So for context, I'm assuming that the audience has seen those or at least uh, been briefed on those and we can dive right into the specifics of inverse design. Inverse design here being going from the functionality, from the property of interest to the uh, chemical, uh, structural, and stoichiometric space. So identifying what is that material that we need to make. And a little bit of history uh, for those who may be joining the field recently, the in the very, I think it was the first generation EFRC was the Center for Inverse Design um, led out of Colorado, and then uh, a follow-up uh, EFRC called CMD, CMGMD, um, at, which, which was in this general space of how do you go from properties to a material, the latter focused more on synthesis, on incorporating metastability and figuring out synthesis routes to actually make the materials that were posited by inverse design. So going back to this perspective piece, I wanted to pull up three uh, challenges that were stated in this perspective. Uh, distill it down to three discrete points and then address them over the course of today's uh, discussion. Challenge number one is that many technological applications demand compounds that exhibit contradicting attributes. What does that mean? Well, what that, what the, the way that uh, was described in, the, in this paper, a, a few examples were given, for example, transparent conducting oxides. If you want it to be transparent, typically you want a large band gap. If you want it to be conducting, typically you want high electron concentration, so you'd want small band gap, and those are contradicting properties or contradicting attributes of the material. And you can go down the list. Uh, we want something that's easily manufacturable but stable for 20 years. Those are contradicting. You want um, a material with a high electrical conductivity but low thermal conductivity, at least for most compounds that aren't phonon uh, density of states engineered, that's contradicting. Um, and so the list goes on, but this is one important piece to wrap your mind around and, and what gives rise in many cases to the needle in a haystack phenomenon is that you're applying filter upon filter upon filter and very few of the compounds make it through. 
The second challenge is if you want to do true inverse design and go from property to structure, you need an invertible crystallographic representation, meaning the way you represent the crystal to the machine learning algorithm needs to be invertible. You need to be able to uh, embed that chemical and structural information in a way that you can extract it at the end of the process. And this is a major challenge. Many of our favorite representations for property prediction aren't invertible. And the third challenge is the materials need to be synthesizable. Uh, they need to be stable, at least in, in the way that we can make them in some way, shape, or form. Even if it's at higher temperatures and higher pressures, uh, they still have to be synthesizable in some earthly uh, apparatus in order to be truly validated in, in, in a ground truth way. And so this brings us um, to it, it, my interpretation of the difference between generative design and inverse design. They're a bit of, um, they're not contradicting, they're just a bit uh, different in terms of, of the, how they, they operate and, and what their goals are. So if I were to pull the collective wisdom of the scientific body on Wikipedia, um, generative design is an iterative design process. That term iterative design is very important. I'll show a couple of examples as we go that um, generates a certain number of outputs that meet ideally meet uh, the, the constraints of the user, so the target properties. And they involve fine tuning, right? Uh, the challenges involve how you get from A to B, how you get from your initial design to the final ones uh, that exhibit the, the user defined target properties. And so I wanted to highlight a few examples of generative design, uh, first in process optimization, and then later on in materials optimization. So process optimization in general tends to be rather convex and smooth compared to materials optimization, especially when you're dealing with conflicting uh, properties or attributes. But uh, that's what makes it generally tractable using uh, a variety of techniques, uh, Bayesian optimization or um, a genetic algorithm, as we'll show in this case. So this is about silicon solar cells. And this particular case study is uh, was done by David Fenning during his PhD at MIT. He's now a PI of a group at UCSD developing Pascal, a high-throughput perovskite uh, synthesis and characterization tool. Well worth a, a look at some of his more recent work. Uh, but in, in the early teens, he was at MIT, and we were all in the thesis committee meeting upstairs from where I'm talking right now, Jeff Grossman, the one of the developers of CGCNN, was there at the in the room at the time, and he said, "You know, David, you've developed this impurity simulator. Why don't you wrap it in a genetic algorithm?" And that led to this line of research, which I'll describe here. So, in, in a silicon solar cell, uh, the, the synthesis process to make it, you're taking uh, a wafer or, or an ingot, uh, cooling it down from high temperature during crystallization, heating it back up, diffusing it into phosphorus, and then cooling it down to room temperature. And during this phosphorus diffusion step, you're creating the PN junction. The impurities that are residing within the bulk are evolving. During high temperature stages, the precipitates are dissolving, point defect concentrations increasing. As you cool it back down, those point defects have to go somewhere. They either segregate to the top, some of them remain in the bulk, and others re-precipitate at nucleation sites, heterogeneous nucleation sites in the bulk. And so this evolution of the impurities with a time temperature profile can be modeled using uh, first principle simulations. Um, you can develop a series of uh, equations that describe uh, precipitate dissolution and, and uh, point defect migration. Uh, even the gettering process can be modeled using a series of coupled partial differential equations. And from the final defect distribution, you can calculate a carrier lifetime. That's a measure of the electronic quality of the wafer. And from that carrier lifetime using a numerical device simulation, you can calculate a solar cell efficiency. And so this jump from impurities, the time temperature profile to efficiency, we called impurities to efficiency calculator or I2E for short. And per Jeff Grossman's uh, advice, we looped this inside of a genetic algorithm. And the way the GA works is as follows. You start with a certain time temperature profile that you're trying to optimize for that phosphorus diffusion step. It then mutates that, that parent generation, creating in, in the lingo of genetic algorithms, several daughter uh, uh, time temperature profiles. We give them generational names, Gen 1, Gen 2. And then we test the fitness of each one. In other words, we drive the um, material through our impurities to efficiency calculator and see what the resulting solar cell efficiency would be. Those underperforming ones are removed and the fittest are propagated further into Gen 3, 
And this continues for some time until eventually you wind up with a multi-generational uh, examination or evolution of the time temperature profile. What that looks like when, you, when you're at a, around generation, well, actually, if you superimpose, superimpose all of the generations on top of one another and look at the time temperature profiles here, you can see minority care lifetime. That's the parameter we want to optimize. We want it to be large. So we're looking for the trend in dark lines. And sure enough, we see um, the, the optimum time temperature profile is one that maintains a high temperature initially, but then cools down slowly enough for those point defects to be gathered away. And you can validate that experimentally as well. The different uh, time temperature or canonical uh, time temperature profiles shown in the same color scheme on the left um, and the um, harmonic root mean uh, minority care lifetime is shown here on the y-axis, a measure of electronic quality. So again, there's some experimental validation that indeed the time temperature profile that was generated by the computer, by the genetic algorithm, is yielding optimal results. And this was 2014 work, actually happened earlier, published in 2014, and helped cut out some of that trial and error work in the middle where you're just tuning parameters by gut feel, uh, as opposed to taking, uh, removing some of those um, experiments into the and, and bringing them into the computer, running them in the computational environment, and then bringing them back out into the field. And by packaging this up in a GUI and working, I think we worked with about a dozen to two dozen solar companies to improve their time temperature profiles at various stages of their manufacturing. Um, so this was a, an early success story of the group in, um, I would call it more generative design, in this case of processes, not materials. Um, in systems, a similar type of approach was taken to develop uh, solar power desalination systems together with Amos Winter in the Gear Lab at MIT. This is Sterling Watson up here. She's now at Natel Energy. She's developing small-scale hydro that allows salmon to swim up river, uh, but still generate power at, at in smaller rivers in an environmentally friendly and non-disruptive way. And so the trick of a solar power desalination unit is really combining all these different elements and sizing them in a way that's cost-effective. Um, so this is the overall system. Again, you have a, a, a set of, of coupled variables in your system. And in a very similar approach, you can use uh, a, a, a particle swarm optimization type approach to evolve the system and eventually reduce in this case, the system cost by about 50%. And in so doing, opened up the community's eyes to a couple of other important factors that if one uh, co-optimizes the, uh, especially the electrodialysis uh, membranes in the systems to run on variable voltage, you could extract even more cost savings from the system. And that drove the, the team in Amos Winters group uh, to develop a, a, a variable voltage uh, component with their solar power desalination unit. It was installed in India and after uh, some work, it, it's now running and, and producing clean water for a local village in Chiluru. And we, we see more recent examples. I, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of Autodesk's um, work. So AutoCAD Fusion 360 has a generative design package that allows you to co-optimize for mechanical properties, manufacturability and cost. And this is an example taken from this website here of somebody designing a chair. I'd say the, some of the areas to really look out for here are places where um, weight is at a premium, uh, but mechanical strength is also very important, such as aerospace applications. You uh, are beginning to see some, some applications there in Airbus. So to summarize, this generative design approach uh, can be roughly uh, framed as follows. You define the target properties, define the input variables, run some kind of simulation. We'll leave that vague for now. I, I've shown you examples of numerical simulations. Prior to that, it was first principles density functional theory simulations. And then um, ideally calculating the output parameter of merit. And rarely do you get it right the first time through. You need to iterate a few times. You don't hit your targets. You need to go back, redefine your inputs, tweak a little bit, use some principled approach, either a genetic algorithm or a particle swarm optimization, something that make sure that you don't get pigeonholed in a local optimum, but that you ultimately find the global optimum for your system, which is what you desire. So along came Materials Project and fundamentally changed this approach because now there was a database originally of a few tens of thousands. Now uh, in the order of, of 10 to the five, I mean, low to mid 10 to the five uh, compounds, depending on what sets of properties. And this allowed us to search databases, right? So instead of this iterative process where you're trying to find stuff um, uh, iteratively by tweaking it, maybe taking a lattice and switching out an atom 
running it again using your DFT, now you can search a database and see, okay, do any of the uh, uh, compounds in, my, in, in the database exhibit the properties that I desire? And Riley Brandt, as part of the C CMDMG uh, EFRC, uh, uh, was a, a PhD group member, and he defined a series of parameters that were quite squishy, like quality of a solar cell absorber. So materials project, if you look at the different columns that, that are available and you start searching them for formation energy and, and bulk modulus, you don't find a column in there saying quality of a solar cell absorber. You have to start piecing things together using what's called proxy variables. So Riley did that. He utilized certain properties of the valence band structure, the S-type character that was presented by the, um, by the um, atoms comprising the density of states in the valence band of the material, dielectric constant as well. And the principles behind it were, if you have S-type character, you can rotate bonds around without changing the energy of the bond because it has spherical symmetry. Any other kind of bond, if you begin rotating the bond, you start introducing uh, a change of the energy level, uh, perhaps shallow traps, eventually deep traps into the band gap because um, of the directionality of that bond. But S-type character, not so much. And this was really inspired by the methyl ammonium lead halide perovskites. Large dielectric constant for defect screening. The larger your dielectric constant, the more screening there is, and the, uh, the smaller the coulombic radius in general of the uh, 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 charged traps in your system. And so he began screening parameters of merit together with uh, folks at NREL and came up with a, a long, long list of potential compounds, mostly containing P block cations. So these are uh, elements of the set, indium, tin, antimony, thallium, lead, bismuth. And he excluded thallium and lead because of the toxicity, uh, remaining the, the remainder and, and partially ionized because, for example, uh, if you take tin, instead of looking at tin 4+, plus, which would be fully ionized, partially ionized would be tin 2+, plus. that exhibits that, uh, in the case of tin, the 5S shell, full, full 5S shell, or the lone pair, as, as some de in, de depending on the, the crystal structure. Um, and so this uh, list generated a lot of interest in the lab, and we were all very uh, keen to learn more. Um, could we actually make these materials, and could we uh, design them in practice? Um, and so what uh, we did was to run a high throughput experiment, one material per month. And I remember getting the group together downstairs in the lab next door and, and trying to convince them that this was possible. And there was a lot of resistance because at to that point, we were devoting years to studying cuprous oxide and tin sulfide. And that was the norm in, in solar at the time is that you devoted your career sometimes to studying a particular material system. And here I was forcing the group to really explore that list that, that Riley had come up with. Eventually, we didn't produce all of them in-house. We sourced them, some of these from other labs, but we managed to keep up a clip of around one material per month. And of the materials that were predicted to have minority care lifetimes greater than one nanosecond, about five of them out of the six exhibited it. And this greatly increased the number of classes of known compound uh, to have uh, in thin film form minority care lifetimes greater than one nanosecond. So it was a encouraging result, but still very much just a, a, a brute force technique of searching existing databases. And if there was any data scarcity or data bias in your database, you might miss certain compounds. You might not see them. And so this led to um, an effort within our, our lab to start experimentally synthesizing so-called white spaces or blank spaces within materials databases, could we go ahead and, and start filling in those gaps? And I, I don't credit ourselves only for having this idea. There are many groups around the same time, including the figure from Alex Zunger that I showed at the beginning of the talk, showing these, these blank spaces in, in state space. Um, the way we approached it was to develop a high throughput uh, R&D platform, high throughput compared to one material a month. This one was about one material every five minutes. And that was uh, pretty good at the time. And Xi Jing Sun, uh, who's now at TRI, really led this effort. Um, she and, and, and colleagues at MIT uh, developed a, a series of building block uh, precursors. At the time, we called them Lego blocks. I like to think of them more as a spice rack now, where you mix and match different pieces, make the precursors, and then test them out. And it's, it's pure combinatorics. So out of this effort, um, there were about 
let's see, on average, probably somewhere between four and eight repeats per material, per compound. And that's what bumped a lot of them from not soluble or unidentifiable up to one of the other classes up here. So you do have to try things out a few times before that you get them to work sometimes. But out of this uh, combinatorics effort, four materials were produced in thin film form for the first time. Um, they had previously been only reported in, in bulk crystals. And then two new material systems here were had no prior literature reports. Um, the, this material down here at the bottom, uh, which was ultimately synthesized in both bulk and thin film form, and this um, this uh, alloy series, if you will, in the middle, um, which uh, ultimately was tested out and shown to exhibit band gap Boeing. I'll get to that in the next slide. But the important thing was in a period of around two months, this generated the equivalent in the past of what would be around six journal articles worth of content, right? Just brute forcing your way through uh, combinatorics in a given uh, chemical space. And this is the Banget Boeing um, uh, that was that was shown. Uh, LBNL has has a good history studying these in three fives, and um, this was particularly interesting to to see in in these um, perovskite systems, or shall we say, perovskite inspired materials systems, to be precise. Um, but that gets us back to this challenge number one here, which is we're not necessarily solving this problem, which is finding materials with contradicting attributes. In fact, none of these materials that we had quote unquote discovered or shown to exhibit high minority care lifetimes wound up in a high performance solar cell because while we were screening for minority care lifetime, another property is also very important, which is carrier mobility. You don't only really need to excite the minority carriers by sunlight, they need to be able to move to the terminals where they can be collected and removed from the device. And many of the materials that we were studying have low transport isotropy, meaning they're highly anisotropic when it comes to carrier mobility. And so we needed to start layering different properties on top of one another to be able to ultimately stack and find those ideal materials, not just hunting for one. So this provoked us in, in a way to change our strategy and think about other routes and approaches to getting the job done. So instead of running simulations here and iterating until a target is reached, now we'll start talking about using machine learning surrogate models and to achieve our output parameters of interest and either solving those directly or using particle swarm optimization uh, to solve um, uh, in, in, a, in an inverse design way. So again, just to recap, what we're about to show is are a couple of examples where we've trained a machine learning regressor that can predict the output properties of interest given a set of inputs. And now we're, we, we extrapolate that regressor across space, interpolate, and, and in some cases extrapolate. I'll get to how we do that. And then uh, use that in an inverse way to be able to predict what input parameters we should use to get a certain output. And as mentioned by Anubhav during the introduction, a lot of this work was done in Singapore. Why Singapore? Well, uh, Singapore has the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology, or SMART for short which is MIT's research enterprise in Singapore. And I was uh, stationed there originally for six months, but it began slipping. We uh, started forming a startup company, took a leave of absence, the pandemic hit. A few things happened that were, I think probably a once in a lifetime opportunity for me that extended my stay in Singapore quite some time. And so during the past five or six years, I've been based in Singapore all but about uh, two out of those years. So the majority of my time. And one of the ways that we um, developed, uh, we, we, we integrated the machine learning algorithms, in, uh, sorry, the machine learning regressors in a way that allowed us to extrapolate forward was to work in this hybrid space between uh, numerical models and surrogate models. And I'll show a couple of examples of how this was done. Danny Wren, uh, Danny was a, a PhD student initially, and then um, graduated, was a postdoc for a while, is now at Shintera. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, it's a startup company. So uh, Danny developed a, a gallium arsenide um, uh, manufacturing approach that used a Bayesian network. Uh, he held the record efficiency solar cell in Singapore, um, that record for a few years, in fact. And uh, part of the process was developing a very high efficiency gallium arsenide top cell semi-transparent uh, for a silicon bottom cell. So it was a 3-5 silicon tandem that, that he had developed. And so this was a story about the top 
uh, cell, the gallium arsenide, where traditionally what you're doing is you're just measuring some properties here, like efficiency and short circuit current, open circuit voltage fill factor. These are properties of the solar cell that you can measure by attaching electrical probes to it and putting it underneath a solar simulator. Um, and what you're often trying to get at, though, are the bulk and interface properties. So these are things like minority care lifetime, minority care mobility, acceptor concentration of the uh, active dopants, front and rear surface recombination velocities at the interfaces, and shunts and series resistances within the final device. And you're really trying to infer those to do root cause analysis so that when your device doesn't work well, you can figure out what went wrong. And so this is an approach that links the process variables up front together with these hidden variables in the middle and ultimately leads to an improved solar cell device efficiency. What uh, he did here was to implement a technique known as Bayesian inference that was originally developed uh, by uh, Riley Brandt and Rachel Kirchen for thin film solar cells. He implemented it here for gallium arsenide and was uh, able to connect it all the way back to process variables. In this case, the temperature of growth of his gallium arsenide solar cells. And what he was able to see was that the zinc emitter doping, this is for the bulk, um, and the, the silicon base doping, sorry, the zinc and the, the silicon were related to uh, uh, the, the, the different layers of the device. Front surface recombination velocity you want minimized over here. Rear surface recombination velocity you want minimized over here. In bulk minority care lifetime, you want optimized somewhere here in the middle. And the trouble was the design of experiments initially was only one temperature, right? It was either 530, 680, or some temperature in between, right? It wasn't uh, an, a, a modulated time temperature profile changing the temperature for each layer. But what he was able to see when he ran this DOE and then ran Bayesian inference that allowed him to visualize the, the values of the hidden variables here in the middle, these guys, he was able to see that he needed to grow the rear at, oh, sorry, it's one over. So that he needed to grow the rear at, 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 at a lower temperature, the, the front at a higher temperature, and the bulk in the middle. And so he stacked up his device in such a way that he could do this practically in the MOCVD chamber and then obtained a solar cell efficiency that was around 6.5% relative higher than any of the DOE values that he had picked in the middle. In other words, this ML approach allowed him to break out of the DOE box. The DOE box just said, grow at one temperature. And by looking at the Bayesian inference and applying human expertise, he was able to uh, be inspired to create a new time temperature profile. Likewise, um, there was work ongoing at ASTAR at the Agency for Science, Technology, and Advanced Research. I was given the opportunity to launch a, a 18 million US dollar five-year program at ASTAR that expanded the range of applications beyond solar into other areas, including polymers, nanoparticles, ICs, metals, magnetic materials. And one of the researchers who I had the pleasure of working with, his name is Jatin Kumar. Uh, he's now at Shintera as well, the startup company. I'll explain what that is toward the end. Um, and what he he's a polymer expert, and he was interested in modifying the polymer cloud point transition temperature. That's a phase property of the polymer, the temperature at which you go from a clear solution to a cloudy suspension, and it's a reversible process. Once the temperature lowers back down, um, the, the solution becomes clear again. And he was able to create 17 new polymers using an inverse design approach, which worked as follows. First, he would develop a series of polymers by changing the amounts of these four different building blocks. Let's call them A, B, C, and D. So the percentage of A, the percentage of B, percentage of C, and percentage of D are the input features that define the polymer in this particular case. And then the output property of interest was the polymer cloud point transition temperature, a singular value, but a continuous variable. After training the model, in this case, a, a tree-based model, um, you can then, with that trained regressor, uh, fit it with a neural network and then uh, perform inverse design using particle swarm optimization. And so this is what they did. Um, Jatin, myself, and a few others, we uh, started picking polymer cloud point transition temperatures and then asking the computer algorithm to go ahead and make them. And these are the orange dots on this, um, on this uh, uh, plot down here at the bottom. The orange triangles are the computer generator or the computer predicted polymers, percentage of A, B, C, and D, polymer compositions 
that yield the polymer cloud point transition temperature of interest. So within a limited subset of building blocks, we were able to develop this model, this inverse design model. It is not a general inverse design model for all polymers. It only works for this particular set of polyoxazoles, but at least this is a start. Another approach was developed by Flor Miki Berada at NUS in Zaif Khan's group. So I'll explain what she did there. She developed a two-step machine learning algorithm. Step one was to basically grow a sparse data set of silver nanoparticle growth, right? So she was growing silver nanoparticles from a series of input solutions shown over here. They were all entering into a T valve, separated little experiments separated by oil. So each droplet in here is a unique experiment, is a unique combination of these different precursors, which are all controlled by computer syringe pumps. And what she's doing is in the beginning, she's measuring the optical properties and expanding the data set using BO, but eventually running a neural network in parallel with the Bayesian optimization to perform regression and to use that to, be, to begin doing inverse design. So let's walk through what we did initially. We defined a target for our Bayesian optimization. This was a plasmon resonance simulation of a silver nanoparticle. Here's the spectrum that came out. And then we measured the spectrum using an absorptance measurement here. And there was some TEM for validation over there as well. And you can see the evolution of the, let's say the, the two most determining input variables as, as we determined through um, feature importance ranking. So your, your two variables, uh, the, the a nanoparticle seed concentration and the silver nitrate uh, concentration, you can see the manifold, the five dimensional input manifold projected onto 2D and then the loss function, which in this particular case, because we're dealing with a spectrum is cosine similarity, um, read more about it in the paper. Uh, you can see it converging here and, and the algorithm converging at the end. And what's cool about this is you can begin to see that the cosine similarity loss function also penalizes you for having too big of a background outside of your peak in your spectrum. So it's a very nice loss function when you're trying to optimize the full spectrum. And the particle is, is beginning to approximate here that, that target uh, uh, or particle. But what's cool about this is that when you've developed that uh, deep neural network regression, you can then perform inverse design in the same way that was done in the, in the polyoxazoline project, which is to say you develop a color uh, um, map. Um, this is uh, essentially the, the nanoparticle or the, the, the predicted color of the nanoparticles from our neural network um, projected onto the eye's uh, photo response curve, generating a nice color like this. And what you see, points A, B, C, and D are approximately in plane. Uh, and these four different uh, curves represent the experiment and the predicted values from the regressor. So it's functioning-ish, like, a, like a, an inverse design algorithm where a human can go along and say, now I want a yellow silver nanoparticle. Now I want a purple silver nanoparticle. And this algorithmic framework can start to develop it. But that's not a crystal per se, right? That's not exploring all composition space, that's still process space. We now want to do general inverse design for all elements in the periodic table and all structures. So how do we go about doing that? We need an invertible crystallographic representation. Invertible in the sense that if our training set goes into the algorithm as here are the structures and, and I wanna to get to property, we then have to invert it and go from property back to structure on the other side. And so this led to the development of uh, Fourier transform crystal properties or FTCP for short, which was recently published in Matter. And the, the, the premise of this algorithm, I'll, I'll let Danny, the original inventor of the algorithm speak for himself in a couple of slides. We have a nice video of him since he couldn't make it. He's over in Singapore, um, but he'll, he'll be able to share in his, in his own words what, what he's been up to. The nice thing about this uh, algorithm is it was inspired by a couple of things. First of all, um, the VAE or vari variational autoencoder style uh, uh, inverse design or, or uh, work that, that uh, Rafa Gomez Bombarelli and others have done for polymers and, and small molecules um, can also be transferred over into inorganic crystals with the right materials representation. And the other interesting piece of it was because we're dealing with crystals, we have the opportunity to represent them both as uh, real space and inverse space. Um, it turns out that depending on what sort of property you're trying to predict, uh, the inverse space representation may or may not be useful uh, in terms of predicting the experimental accuracy. And that's why the entire 
representation of the material is very modular. You can go in and start ripping out pieces of the representation. We do that frequently. Um, there's a real space feature uh, block over here, this one, and a reciprocal space feature block, and a whole lot of zero padding in the middle. And that's one of the weaknesses of this particular representation. It's why we have a strong sense that there's still a lot of green space out there for materials representation. Um, all of these are zeros. And uh, in many cases, uh, the, the, the representation for simple structures like gallium arsenide is filled with zeros because your element matrix is running across all, depending on how you size it, but you could size it as, as all the non-radioactive elements in the periodic table, essentially hydrogen to, to bismuth minus uh, promethium technetium. So you'd be talking about 81 elements um, sitting in here. So if you're only dealing with two, that's a whole lot of zero padding, right? 79 zeros in there. And then the lattice matrix and site coordinate matrix, that's uh, also a lot of empty space if you have a sparse, this is a, a zinc blend structure. So there's a lot of empty space in the zinc blend structure. You have a lot of zeros in there. Um, the site occupancy is what we use when we're mixing uh, different alloys. So like copper zinc tin sulfide and um, maybe uh, three, five materials, different alloys where you wanna mix site occupancy, that would be uh, this. And then the elemental property matrix is a fudge factor. It's uh, embedding elemental properties into the FTCP representation um, like electronegativity, uh, polling electronegativity. But then you ask yourself, what electronegativity? Um, do I wanna embed the neutral electronegativity or do I, you know, for sodium, there's a huge difference between sodium neutral and sodium plus one, right? You're stripping away that S shell electron, um, exposing the, the P. So everything is different, right? About the, uh, the, the two different species. And yet, I mean, what do you choose to put in there? It's gonna affect the outcome. So I, I've never been a fan personally of the element property matrix, although it's useful in terms of predicting accuracy in many cases, which suggests some universal principles for the atoms that can be um, uh, better uh, expressed through that uh, part of the representation. And I'm gonna let Danny uh, share in his own words, some of the inspiration for forming FTCP. So hopefully this plays. Well, what inspired, what inspired me in the FTCP study are essentially two factors. So the first is uh, similar studies that has been done for small molecules for drug design. And so that you have those uh, different generative models that has been developed and applied to molecules. So I was thinking, why can't we do this to crystals? Then the second factor, which is also the most important one, is the is actually materials project. And with materials project, we have the access to the DFT uh, data uh, uh, at ease for all the crystals. And uh, and then and then if you look at the distribution of elemental distribution of uh, materials project, you will notice there are like uh, most of the data sort of concentrate on oxides, halide, and this is not really even. So that makes me wondering, like, can what happens to other species of elements? And so, what what Danny's alluding to in terms of the blank spaces within materials project is shown here. This is materials project plotted on two axes, um, space group number for three dimensional crystalline solids and atomic number. Um, and what you can see are some gaps. I mean, some of them might be physics related, but other ones might simply be due to the fact that there was never a grant to study that particular compound or, or set of compounds. And so the, the idea of embedding or training the distributions of properties within a latent space in principle would allow you to sample more homogeneously the, the, the different elements or the different compounds out the other side. And the biggest challenge that we ran into um, was stability, synthesizability. No surprise here, right? This is, a gener this is a, an inverse design algorithm with a decoder portion of the VAE. And to be honest with you, it spits out a whole lot of bogus materials, right? Um, materials that might, on, on, uh, to, to a few tens of percent validity ratio are, are valid, meaning that they uh, do exhibit the, the properties that you're, you're targeting based on, uh, at least from what we can tell, first principles DFT validation. But in terms of synthesizability, in many cases, still leave a lot to be desired. So what's important to keep in mind is when you're doing inverse design, you're 
hit rate is a little bit different than a regression algorithm. When you're trying to do regression, you want to hit, I don't know, 90% uh, uh, accuracy to be able to rival human uh, levels. But for inverse design, especially in spaces with contradictory uh, attributes, there is no compound out there. It's a binary, you don't have it, or you have something that meets those criteria. And so your success rate only really needs to be one over your experimental throughput. So let's say over your project, you can make a thousand samples. You need one of those samples to be successful, right? So um, we can deal with a lot of compounds not working out if, and only if, we get a few of them that do. But that's the critical point, is how do we enrich the pool of generated compounds out of the decoder of the VAE that are stable, that are synthesizable. And so um, there's a lot of work in this space. I, I would refer you to some of the papers coming out of Shui Pingong's team, um, one of the original developers of Magnet and, um, and, and doing some great work now on, on stability and, and uh, st let's call it energy relaxation prediction um, in high throughput uh, fashion. And then uh, ultimately the experimental validation, in our case, in the FTCP paper published in Matter earlier this year, the focus was really on, um, on DFT. Uh, we weren't yet at the point of doing experimental validation. We tried, it was during the pandemic. The only lab that was open was um, our, our friend, Professor Lee over at Shanghai University. He made a Herculean effort with a beautiful laboratory to do high throughput arc melting of, of metal alloys and explored some intermetallics of silicon, manganese, and cobalt. Um, but that material, that phase ultimately decomposed into two other phases because it just wasn't stable under the conditions that he was growing the materials and testing them at. And so the, these areas here, three, which is how to filter out the compounds, not just for stability, but anything you'd like, um, charge, neutrality, uh, coordination number, bond distances. If you, if you want to sample from the mean, and you want to filter out those extreme compounds, um, this is the place to do it either up front before the algorithm or after the algorithm is a filter, if you have the compute power to do so. The danger there being, if you're sampling from the mean, you're gonna be getting pretty average compounds and at best you're gonna be filling in these blank spaces with patterns that already fit, but you won't get many exceptional compounds that are at the tails of the distributions like super hard materials, to borrow an example from a previous speaker from Taylor Sparks. Um, in terms of validation from first principles, I, I do think that now the experimental throughputs are starting to reach the point in these autonomous labs that you should start seeing the connection or workflow integration of these generative design or inverse design algorithms, depending what approach you want to take, and high throughput experimentation. And that's going to be super, super interesting. I imagine um, that there are going to be several announcements over the next year, not, not years, year of new materials that were not known prior, at least not within the ICSD prior, that are now uh, created because of, of this Lego style combining of the different um, blocks of, of uh, ML informed tool that we now have. These are a couple of materials that came out that were validated using DFT. Um, and towards synthesizability, there's a lot of work in this space, but one of the interesting approaches is simply to embed the information of what constitutes a synthesizable and non-synthesizable compound into one of these properties, right? So synthesizability is a property, just like formation energy. And in this case, uh, using a, a cross-reference of, of all of the materials project, is, it in, is this particular compound that we're exploring here, is this one little dot in the ICSD, yes or no? If it is, we give it a one. If it's not, we give it a zero and we segment the latent space according to that property. We now have a filter in that dimension of latent space in order to, in order to predict synthesizability. Is it perfect? No. Um, is, it, is it one method? It's one method. And are there going to be others coming along? Absolutely, I certainly hope so. Um, but this is a ripe area for exploration. How do you improve um, uh, uh, predictive accuracy of, of um, of materials. The other that I wanted to mention is by Isaac. He recently posted a, an article on archive um, focused on, uh, on, on what materials representation is necessary and sufficient to predict materials properties. And so I'll let him share a couple of his own words here about uh, that work. And if I ask you this question, as material scientists, uh, you probably answer um, composition and structure. As so uh, it's a bit faint, but what he's saying here is if I were to ask you the question as a material scientist, what is necessary and sufficient to predict a material property? You might answer 
structure and composition, because that's the way we were trained. We took our group theory class, or if we did solid state physics, or if we use CIV files to predict properties using DFT, that's typically what we get out. Reflected in CIV files and some property prediction machine learning models, such as CGCNN and Magnet, they all use composition and structure as inputs. However, there are recent reports of machine learning models using composition-only inputs, achieving similar results. So this study investigates that effect. By selecting some state-of-the-art machine learning models in each category, so composition-only input, comp, and composition plus structural input, comp struct, to predict properties on the right, as well as investigate some, uh, some of the data set used while performing such property prediction. In our results, top versus bottom is the choice of stable versus unstable data set. So for the interest of time, I'll summarize here. What's shown in the case of both stable and unstable combos, these are ones that might contain a lot of polymorphs, right? Um, energy above Paul is quite large. And stable would be the ones within a certain delta E. Uh, in this case, we called it 100 MeV. I, I know, I know. It's not always 100 MeV, uh, amorphous limit and so on. Yes, but for the purposes of a quick filter on materials project, um, we call it 100 MeV per atom. Um, the, the interesting thing is in both cases, there's very little benefit in many properties like band gap to adding in the structural information. You get really good predictive accuracy of that property just using the composition and stoichiometric information alone. Of course, when you go to point density, that's the density of lattice points per unit volume. Yeah, of course, you need the structure, otherwise you're, you're, you're not gonna be able to compute that. But what it suggests is that there's a lot more to be explored in materials representation. Um, and for more information, I'd, I'd refer you to the archive paper. Oh. Um, of course, science is always driven by humans. Um, I have to credit Aaron Walsh for some wonderful discussions and Chen Shao Li, who's not here, applied mathematician over at NUS, was uh, also a, a great ally in that, in that study. Gaining human trust, probably a whole nother seminar. We're now 10 up to the hour. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump over this section. I'm really sorry to do it. This is all about interpretability, equation extraction, but I'm just gonna run over the slides quickly. If you're interested in it, happy to talk more. Um, our open sourcing efforts. I wanna conclude the talk by sharing a couple of key points. Number one is um, Danny and Jatin and a few others, after um, doing their, their base work at SMART and at ASTAR, they're forming Shintera, which is a startup company focused on developing new materials for customers using uh, these and, and other machine learning and high throughput methods. Uh, the focus is really on making uh, real materials and they're already working with several uh, paying customers on their path to uh, uh, growing the company. Uh, Kedar Hippolgaonkar, who took over the Accelerated Materials Development for Manufacturing Program uh, at ASTAR, um, and it will be giving a talk at the upcoming Acceleration Consortium meeting in Toronto, will be sharing more information about what Shintera is up to in a couple of weeks time, uh, hopefully some exciting results there to share. Um, so going back to this framing question, inverse design, are we there yet? Uh, not yet. Um, I think there are some green spaces. I, I do think we're going to get there. Uh, we'll convincingly get there in a few specialized domains. General inverse design is a bit further afield. And these are some of the green spaces, materials representations, improved refinements or filters, the charge neutrality bond distance and so on. Transformers, a whole lot more to say there. Um, synthesizability estimators, knowledge inference and uncertainty estimation, ethics and dual use, big one. Again, whole nother talk on that one, but how do we prevent intentional and unintentional misuse inside and outside of the firewall of these types of tools? Um, wanted to conclude by our, our, our new lab logo down here. Um, this was generated through a machine human collaboration, if you will. We first drove uh, a series of queries through um, Dali Mini, generating a whole bunch of ideas and eventually uh, used those ideas to inspire a bona fide graphics artist. This is RG, he's an entrepreneur, um, and he developed the logo for us. So I think in the near term, at least, we're gonna see a whole lot of this of domain experts using emerging tools to be able to refine, right? Um, in the words of one of our lab members, um, I, I don't necessarily agree, but the word, she, she said that this particular logo looked unprofessional, even though I, I tended to like it very much. 
But uh, I think that combination of machine and human expertise, at least for the near term, um, is going to yield a number of highly professional and hopefully beneficial outcomes. And it's all about the humans at the end of the day. Um, remember that it's, um, you know, I, I keep this, this glove here in the laboratory um, just to maybe stop sharing on the screen. I keep this glove in the lab and it says, if you could make any material to solve any problem, what would you make? And there's a lot of um, subtext to that uh, reference there. It's just something to keep in mind. So with that, I'll turn it over to the Q&A, to the moderator. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Tonio, for the wonderful talk. And uh, please don't snap your fingers <laughs> while wearing that glove. Um, it looks like we have a bunch of questions on the Q&A. Um, so what we usually do, Tonio, is you can just read through those questions. If any of them look interesting to you, maybe just repeat it back and then uh, go ahead and answer it. And you know, I think we have about six or seven minutes to go through these. So whichever ones look the most interesting to you would be great. So floor is, floor is yours. Awesome, thank you. I, I'm trying to bunch and bundle in real time here. So um, in, in terms of inverse design device architectures, so, um, you know, I, I think there you, you can, I, I think the generative design approaches are already getting pretty close. So what we have now established, there's, a, there's an ACS paper recently published by myself and Professor Aaron Thien from NUS campus. Um, on uh, using these types of tools to uh, identify faults in integrated circuits, three nanometer node integrated circuits. And what was particularly useful there was combining TCAD as the forward model and then driving that in a, an intelligent uh, uh, way to minimize compute time and identify uh, what the root causes of, of uh, the defects were inside of those devices. So slightly different than the question you're asking, but I think that general principle can be expanded. Um, you know, there's a lot of different groups out there doing generative design. Um, I, I highlighted a few of them based on um, certain groups have been very active and vocal uh, at, at academic scientific conferences and on LinkedIn, um, and some of them even on Twitter. Um, and those are the, the use cases that I've been pulling from because that information is in the public domain uh, and, and is, is uh, quite connected with our, our, our materials informatics community. Um, how, how does the FTCP lead to the invertibility you are targeting, right? So um, in this particular case, um, there is uh, ah, so um, much longer discussion, but what comes out of the decoder side of the neural network of the variational autoencoder is another matrix of the same format as the FTCP. So anytime you can represent your input and output as matrices instead of say graphs, um, you can fill in the same spots with numbers. Whether those numbers are complete junk or not um, depends on the, the sophistication of the representation, uh, the training quality, and, and other aspects of, of the model um, and the training process. But that's generally how FTCP has that advantage. And there are some other interesting um, developments. I would encourage you to look at uh, Crystal to PNG, for example, by Sterling in, in, in Taylor Sparks group. It's very good. Um, what are limitations of data and model architecture? Ah, um, at this point in time, what are the data or model architecture, which is more important to overcoming inverse design? I think both are gonna be going hand in hand. Um, I think as the generative models get better, you're gonna see more data. And as the high throughput experimentation systems get better, you're gonna see more data. And the, uh, the greater availability of the data is going to help refine the models. Um, the models may even be helpful in creating uh, the data itself. So I, I don't see it as an either or, I see it more as a, as a co-evolution. And if you look to some of our neighboring fields adjacent to material science, they seem to be undergoing exactly that transformation. Um, let's see, crystal generation, high dimensional space. Yes, 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 yes. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I'm assuming the question here about crystal generation from high dimensional space to low dimensional space uh, in is referring to the variational autoencoder, the VAE. Um, so when it, what's important to note is that when you're in latent space in the middle of your vari variational autoencoder, and you take a small step 
in property segmented latent space, if you trained it properly, the property doesn't change by much. Let's say you, you're dealing with band gap and you take a, a small little step of 0 0.01 electron volts. But the crystal structure and composition, you could be jumping from one region of the periodic table to the other, from one spot in, in materials project to another, or even materials outside of materials project that haven't been uh, made yet. And so um, there's an entire section in the supporting information of the matter paper, uh, the FTCP paper focused on sources of noise, sources of variance. And uh, I would encourage you to look there um, very comprehensive discussion about uh, luck of the draw variance, um, training error, um, reconstruction loss, and, and more. Uh, last few points from your experience is the threshold for energy convex hull estimated from DFT, which predicted materials might be made. Yes. So I, I think the, the papers that I, I've been following most closely in this space of synthesizability are really what spun out of that EFRC that I mentioned earlier. So uh, the groups in Berkeley area, uh, including LBNL, um, that are developing uh, more sophisticated metrics for, uh, for, for uh, synthesizability and metastability. And I would encourage you to explore them, especially the ones that discuss the amorphous limit. We've taken a slightly different approach, which is to try to predict decomposition um, propensity. Right, so we, we we're assembling an ensemble of synthesizability predictors, which hopefully, as a collective, will be able to guide us uh, and, and rank the compounds that our inverse and generative design algorithms will predict, uh, rank them for us so that we don't feed as much um, low probability candidates into our experimental pipeline. Do I do any work on battery materials? Yes, um, mostly um, that SEI layer uh, that that forms. Um, Thank you very much. Please, which featureizers are based on example structure but, or for classification machine? Okay, so the structure based um, features that we were considering, uh, there, there are many, um, but uh, you, could, you could do anything from point density to density. Those are heavily dependent on structure. If you wanted to get more into, um, in, into what's commercially available, not commercially available, but available open source today, um, let me see if I can find a couple of them. Um, Let's see, from Isaac's paper, um, there would be, uh, th there'd be a series of options available. I will try to find that paper and, and put it inside of our, our link so you can go through and, and identify them. Um, compositional tools can be used. Uh, yes, yeah, so FTCP is available. All of these tools are, are available for download on our, on our GitHub. So if you go to pv-lab on GitHub, you can download everything. Um, there's also on my Twitter account, if you go to the very top, the pinned link is one that organizes all of our open source code for perovskites in one page. Uh, it's better to use a computer monitor, not a cell phone, uh, to see them all laid out. Um, why did composition models and structural models achieve similar performance? <laughs> so that's a, a topic of an entire talk. We don't have a definitive answer yet. So as the scientist in me, I'll say it's inconclusive at the moment. The hypothesis former in me will say it's probably because critical information about the structure is being passed into the neural network from composition alone. Um, so the same way that Mendeleev and others were able to look at an, a, an ensemble of elements and then structure them a certain way uh, by, by, by pattern recognition, I think in a similar way trained on materials project, there's certain structural information. Structure is after all a property that's getting convoluted with the, 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 the chemical information. Um, and then pass through the, the, the network. Um, th there are deferring impressions though about this. So if you talk to Aaron Walsh or talk to Chen Shao or talk to Isaac, you'll get slightly different answers. I hope our paper did a good job of, of synthesizing them all. Um, for inverse design of crystal materials, what is the biggest challenge right now? Uh, I think I addressed that. Um, the dimensionality of FTCP. Okay, so um, the FTCP algorithm, we, we've worked with, 2D and 3D materials so far, um, they both work fine. Um, I would say very well. There's a data set out of NUS, out of the Center for 2D Materials that um, is a good training set if you're into 2D materials exploration. So I think of thousand or so compounds, maybe a few thousand. Um, and so if you're if you're trying to explore new materials, this, this would be the space. In terms of the uh, different layers of the neural network that's described in the paper and also in, um, in the, in, in the code, 
um, the latent space is very high dimensional. So it's, uh, it's because of the high dimensionality of the FTCP input matrix, the latent space itself is, is not just like a two or a three dimensional space. It is, uh, as I recall, very high dimensional, tens of dimensions, um, high tens, maybe low hundreds, depending on the incarnation. Um, is the inverse design of FTCP method interpretable? Ah, um, that is, can we figure out why the inverse design methods possess certain targeted properties? So here's how I would go about answering that question. What I would do is I'd start, I, I develop a, a GUI that would allow me to click on a point in latent space, in property segmented latent space, and begin using my cursors to kind of probe around and see on the right-hand side of my screen, the crystal structure pop up and use an human intuition and try to infer which are the, uh, the, the uh, general characteristics of a set of compounds in this particular space that might exhibit those properties. Um, similar to how, we, how Riley inferred that the partially ionized P-block cation was uh, important for defect tolerance in, in solar cell materials, and then generalize that principle. Um, in terms of automating that, um, there are approaches to automating that as well, and it essentially involves extracting certain human interpretable features out of the three-dimensional structure. So I would argue that any machine learning algorithm is interpretable. Not every machine learning algorithm is interpretable by a human. And so we need some work there to interface with our, the way our brains think and the way we, we organize um, uh, features in, in three-dimensional space. Um, is there any project description I missed in inclusion recycling and use of original elements? Um, so there, there, I'll answer that in two pieces. One, uniqueness is a property of the generated compounds that is uh, certainly high on our radar and other groups as well. Um, there's uh, some groups in China that are using uniqueness as the output uh, uh, filter for the, pro the, the materials that they're generating, in that case by GAN. Um, the Utah group is using uniqueness as well as one of their filters. Um, I would say for recycling, not of recycling of compounds uh, in the training set and their motifs, but recycling of the actual materials for sustainability, there is also um, ways, there are ways that you can featureize the materials um, so that they can be uh, uh, ranked in terms of recyclability. And we have done that as well. Um, it's all about coming up with clever features that link directly to either the material toxicity and, and, and manufacturing, uh, say, cost to humanity, or on the output side, at the end of life, how easy the material is to be uh, repurposed. Um, and in general, reducing the number of ingredients is also very beneficial. Um, we get into a lot of trouble once we have mixed uh, products with many materials flows into a single object. Uh, they become very difficult to uh, recycle. Um, so simplicity is good. Are there any good ways of extrapolating to discover un unprecedented materials? So I think um, these, these models that at their core, uh, so extrapolate, I'm going to, I'm going to loosely, I'm going to broaden that a bit and say, is there any way to go beyond the set of materials that are trained in the model to create new ones outside of the model? Yes, the FTCP algorithm does that. The variational autoencoders do that. Um, they can generate compounds that aren't in the initial uh, data set. And um, I would say the generative design algorithms also can do that. Uh, but of course, they start from a point and they're, they're expanding upon that. Um, so you can't really expect them to take huge departures in chemical space unless you implement a lot of jitter uh, in the algorithm. So I think that does it for the Q&A. Did I miss anything? Um, there were another two questions that came in, but I'm, I'm conscious we're kind of at the end of the session. So um, I want to say, first of all, thank you to everybody who asked questions and for attending this talk. Thank you, Tonio, for the talk itself. Such a density of really interesting ideas and I think a very optimistic uh, vision for the future of our field as well. I think this was a fantastic talk and I'm really grateful you had the time to join us. Um, thank you so much. Um, and until next time, um, we'll see you uh, in the next seminar. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.